compare and contrast between your type 1 and your type 2 diabetes. So let's talk about exogenous insulin or endogenous, I should say. Let's talk about endogenous insulin. Whenever you hear that word endogenous, that means from within, okay? So an endogenous source of insulin is the source of insulin that the body provides, right? Remember, insulin is produced by the beta cells. The beta cells are in the islets of Langerhans. Islets of Langerhans is located in the pancreas, all right? So with type one diabetics, remember what I said to you. The patients that have type 1 diabetes, that pancreas, for whatever reason, whether it's autoimmune, they were born with it, they have antibodies that are fighting the pancreas, whether it's from a viral infection that disturbed the pancreas, whatever the cause is, type 1 diabetics either produce no insulin whatsoever or the amount that they produce is so small, it doesn't make a difference, okay? So for type 1 diabetics, endogenous insulin is either zero or next to nothing, right? So the patients that are type one diabetics, they require an exogenous source. That word exogenous means from the outside. That means they have to get an outside source of insulin. They have to give themselves injections. And that's why type one diabetics are also known as insulin dependent diabetics. Why? Because if they don't get an exogenous source, they will die. Okay, so make sure you guys know the difference between endo, E-N-D-O, endogenous from within, the body produces it, and exogenous. It's very important, okay? That'll be the difference between, that can be the difference between you getting a question right and wrong, if you know that one word, okay? So your type 1 diabetics require an exogenous source. They need an outside source of insulin because their body's not producing it or it's not producing it enough to keep those cells and tissues alive, right? Your type 2 diabetics. The type 2 diabetics usually don't need an exogenous source unless the diabetes is very far advanced. And here's what I mean by that. Remember what I told you about the type twos. The type twos are not like the type ones, where the type ones, that pancreas is dead, it's shot, it's not working. The type twos, usually there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the pancreas. The pancreas is just tired of the patient's crap. The pancreas is tired of the patient eating whatever they wanna eat, anytime they wanna eat it. So the pancreas is like, you know what, forget you, you're on your own, buddy, right? But as soon as the patient starts exercising, they start eating right, all of a sudden the pancreas, you know, wakes up and shoots out more insulin. So our patients who are type two diabetics, before they get to that point where the pancreas is like, I'm done with you, right? What happens is the pancreas will just start making less and less and less insulin. So what we like to do in the medical field, and guys, this goes across the board for nursing, just keep this concept in mind, always. You always want to start um, low and go slow, except for a few cases, and we'll talk about that later. But you always wanna start low and go slow. And you always wanna go from least invasive to most invasive. So what I mean by that, with the type twos, like I said, usually diet and exercise does the trick, right? But let's say we tell the patient diet, exercise, diet, exercise, and they don't do diet, exercise, right? Our next step with that patient is, of course, diet and exercise, but then we'll add an oral hypoglycemic agent, okay? It's a pill that the patient takes to help lower their blood sugar, right? Maybe they're not compliant with that medication, whatever the case may be, and time goes by, that doesn't work. Our last step is insulin, okay? Because most of these diabetics, we can get that blood sugar down with just diet and exercise unless it's so far gone. So back to um, endogenous, endogenous insulin. For type one, 100% necessary. The patient will die. If they are type one and they don't get an endogenous source, they will die. But your type two have way much more leeway, right? They can do diet and exercise, they can get oral hypoglycemic agents, and if those in combination don't work together, then we'll put them on insulin. But remember, if they start dieting and exercising and doing what they're supposed to do, they can get off of that insulin and still survive because what happens? The pancreas wakes up and starts shooting out insulin, right? Not so much with uh, the type one. The type one will die without insulin. That is huge for you as a student to know because I can't tell you how many test questions come from that alone.
That's a huge difference between your type one and type two. Next, nutritionist state. Your type one, usually, um, because usually they're born with it, they can go one side of the spectrum to the other. They can be very thin or they may be obese. Now your type two, they tend to be frequently, you'll see them overweight. Why? Remember, these are the patients that are non-compliant with the diet and exercise. They're not eating well. They're not eating the way they should. You know, lots of fiber, drinking lots of water instead of juice, you know, getting exercise. Um, they're not doing that, so they tend to be obese. So that's a difference that you'll see in weight. Symptoms. So for type one, and I talked about this shortly, Earlier, those classic, and guys, whenever I'm doing a video and you hear me say classic, write it down because it's going to be a test question. I promise, okay? Your classic symptoms for um, the hyperglycemic state, so that blood sugar being too high, is your polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria. And I want to explain that to you, okay? Polyphagia is excess hunger, polydipsia is excess thirst, polyuria is excess urination. And so let me explain to you what happens. When their blood sugar gets too high, the body will try to compensate. And there's so many ways they try to do this. Why do they get excess hunger? Well, let me tell you what happens. The blood, the blood, the uh, glucose, which is sugar, is stuck in the blood, but it's supposed to be where the tissues and the cells are, right? So the body's screaming, saying, help, help, we need energy. Glucose, where are you? And glucose is like, I'm sorry, bro, I'm stuck in the blood. Unless um, insulin comes to get me out of here, there's nothing I can do to help you. Well, the body tries to survive no matter what. So what the body says is, well, you know what? Since insulin can't give glucose a ride to get to me, and I need this form of energy, I'm gonna start eating away at my own fat, at my own muscle, okay? That's what happens. And so guess what? That's what causes the excess hunger because that patient's body starting to eat away at them because they need the energy. So the patient gets hungry because they're trying to replace what is being eaten away at, right? Excess thirst. The body's meant to survive no matter what. So you got all of this sugar that's stuck in the blood. Guess what the body tries to do? Drink lots of water to do what? Dilute it, right? You got excess urination, that's your polyuria. You got all of this sugar that's stuck in the blood. So the patient starts what? Urinating all over the place trying to get rid of that glucose, okay? It's amazing how God created our bodies to survive. So that's what you're going to see for your um, type 1. And of course, with that comes the weight loss. Because remember, uh, it's burning away its own fat and muscle for um, energy that it's not getting from glucose. Because glucose is stuck where? In the blood. Now for our type 2. Sometimes you can see no sign of symptoms. Why? Remember how I told you, you know... With the type twos, the signs and symptoms are insidious. Remember what I told you insidious mean? It means very sneaky. It develops very slowly, it's very sneaky. So very often you won't even see signs and symptoms until that blood glucose is so high that that patient um, passes out on you and you realize something's wrong, right? So sometimes there are no symptoms. Sometimes there are symptoms and what you'll see is the patient keeps getting chronic infections. Let me explain to you why. Remember what I said, a lot of glucose in the blood, right? Guess what bacteria and pathogens love? Dark, wet, sugary environments. And that's why those patients with diabetes are so at risk for getting infections because of all that sugar. So, you know, whenever we notice a patient keeps getting infections over and over and over and over again, we're going to check the blood glucose because patient has a whole bunch of sugar in the blood. That's a perfect medium for bacteria to grow, to thrive, to multiply. Okay. What are the other signs and symptoms you can see? Also the same as type one, your polyuria, your polyphagia, polydipsia. Please do not forget those three terms. I promise you're going to see it again. Um, ketosis. So, Let's talk about um, ketosis. Type one is more likely to get ketosis, okay? We're gonna talk about ketosis later, but you do have to know who gets ketosis and who gets the HHNKS. 
Type one, more likely to get the um, ketoacidosis, also known as ketosis, and type two, more likely to get the HHNKS, and I'm going to go into detail about those two later when we do the clinical manifestations. Uh, nutritional therapy is essential for both of them. Whether you are type one or type two, um, nutritional therapy is important. The patients have to be eating the right amount of carbs, the right amount of protein, fiber, everything across the board. Um, Insulin, type one, like I said, it's required. If the patient get, doesn't get it, they will die. And type two, not so much. It's not required. Uh, many patients, um, their diabetes can be controlled with just diet and exercise or diet and exercise and oral hypoglycemics, okay? Vascular and neurologic uh, complications, both get them your type one and type two. And I'm gonna explain uh, more about that when we get into the clinical manifestations. But I want you to think about what's happening with both type one and type two, the problem is still the same. Excuse me, the etiology may be different, but the problem is still the same. And the problem is too much sugar in the blood. So I want you to think about all that sugar that's traveling in the blood. Now remember guys, the blood that's what carries, you, you have your RBCs, inside of your RBCs is a hemoglobin. What does a hemoglobin carry? Oxygen, okay? So the blood is what's responsible for transporting oxygen, vitamins, nutrients to all your vital organs, right? And now here you go, you got glucose that's in the blood, slowing the blood down because remember I said, think about glucose just like it is honey. Think about how thick honey is and how slow it moves, okay? So you got all this glucose that's stuck in the blood, that's supposed to be at the tissues and the cells, but it's stuck in the blood, making blood move way more slowly. So guess what? That decreases the amount of oxygen, vitamins, nutrients that the vital organs get, such as your brain, your heart, your liver, your spleen, your kidneys, right? Your eyes.